Hey everyone, I am Miss Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we're going to go through Half-Life, where we're going to learn what is Half-Life, calculations involving Half-Life, as well as the radioactive decay graphs. This is a topic in both the SPM and IGCSE physics syllabus. There is of course a lot more to know about Half-Life, so if you'd like to find out more, please feel free to do your own research or watch my other educational videos. What I'll be covering in this video is just the general information that you would need in order to answer the questions in your examinations. So now, let's get started! First of all, we need to know what radioactive decay is. If you don't know what radioactive decay is, please watch my video first on radioactive radiation in terms of the nuclear emissions where I do explain radioactive decay in more detail. For now, I'm just going to go a quick general overview so that we can get straight to half-life. Now remember, radioactive radiation is emitted from unstable nuclei that are emitting radioactive radiation or ionizing radiation in order to become more stable. So during this process of radioactive decay, it could be emitting alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. The process of this decay is in order to become more stable. So radioactive decay is a process where an unstable nucleus releases, oops, you can't see this anymore, releases radioactive radiation or ionizing radiation to become more stable. This process as it's releasing radioactive radiation is a spontaneous random process. That means there is no way for us to be able to hasten or slow down the process. So if you try, oh, let's try increasing the temperature, increasing the pressure. Maybe if we made it into a liquid or a gas or a solid or whatever. No. The radioactive decay process is a naturally occurring process which will happen on its own. So let's say if we have a radioactive sample consisting of a gazillion of atoms that are all radioactive. These atoms are all unstable, so they're all going to try to release radioactive radiation. But you cannot control this process. You cannot force any of the atoms to you know, not release the radiation or to release it. So let's say, for example, if this atom is going to release it, it will release it. It could release it now. It could release it, you know, five seconds from now, a million years from now. There's nothing you can do to control it. And what happens is these atoms, they could take turns or they could release it at the same time. It doesn't matter. They're just going to release it when they want to release it. So once this nucleus has released radioactive radiation, it would have changed to become something that's more stable. More stable doesn't guarantee that it is stable, so it's just now slightly more stable than it was before. So once this has released the radioactive radiation and it has changed, the number of atoms that are part of the original sample has decreased. So over time, of course, you're going to find that not only does the number of atoms decrease, the level of the radiation that's being released will also decrease. So radioactive decay is a continuous process, but as the process happens, the number of atoms reduces and the number of radiation being released also reduces. In order to calculate this time, this is where we have to learn the concept of half-life. So half-life is the time taken for the mass or the activity of the radioactive sample to decrease by half. The term activity here refers to the level of radiation that's being released. Activity can normally be measured with a Geiger counter, which is represented as count rate. I'm going to write that here for your reference. If you have no idea what a Geiger counter is, please watch my video where I explain about the detection of radioactivity. So as mentioned just now, the number of atoms or the mass 
of the radioactive bits decreases. As the mass decreases, so does the count rate or the activity. So let's say this is a sample of a gazillion atoms in there of the radioactive material. And as time passes, the mass or the activity decreases. So let's say these circles represent the number of atoms or the mass of the original radioisotopes. So whatever that has been decayed, we exclude them because they're no longer the same as they were before. Now, as time passes, the mass or the activity is going to decrease. So let's say, for example, this original number, say 100 grams. As time passes, the number of atoms or the mass decreases. So 100 drops to 99, 98, 97, 96, and so on and so forth. The level of activity could also decrease. So let's say if we took a Geiger counter and we measured the level of uh, activity in terms of the count rate. For example, let's say this was 200 counts per second. I'm going to put here CPS, counts per second. This number is also going to drop because the mass and the number of atoms decreases. Now, half-life refers to how much time it takes for this number or this number to drop to half. So while the number is dropping, okay, we measure the time, and then we stop the timer when it gets to half. Let's say, for example, 50 grams. The count rate would also have dropped to about half, let's say 100 counts per second. So the half-life refers to the time it takes for these numbers to drop to become half. So that's one half-life. It doesn't stop there. The number is going to continue to decrease. Now, keep in mind, these numbers do not decrease at a linear rate. So it's not, oh, 200 to 100 to 0, 100 to 50 to 0. No. It will continue to decrease and half-life is a fixed value. That means that in the same amount of time as before, from 50, it will now drop to half, which is only 25 grams, while the activity would become half. For example, 50 pounds per second. And it will keep dropping. Another half-life, another half, 12.5, 25, and so on and so forth. During a half-life, the values that decrease, not all values decrease by half. So specifically, the values that do decrease by half would be the mass of the original radioisotopes, the activity, or also known as the count rate, that's measured by the Geiger counter, and also the number of atoms of the original radioisotope. The values that don't decrease is the time. The time is fixed. So half-life is a fixed value. And all these numbers have already been discovered by physicists and researchers. So every nuclide has a unique value of half-life. So as you can see from the table over here, every nuclide has a unique value of half-life. And the half-life can range from as low as less than one second, for example, for lithium-8, or can go up to millions of years, as you can see with uranium-235. Different nuclides do have different half-lives. So don't think, oh, this particular element will have the half-life value that's the same. No, uranium-235, uranium-238 could have different half-lives because this depends on that type of nucleus that it has. What causes the half-life to be different from one another? That's not something you need to know. You just need to know every different nuclide, that means every different atom here with its own unique uh, number of protons and nucleons, they have their own unique values of half-lives, and the half-life could be very different, ranging from less than one second to millions of years. Now, let's take a look at a simple half-life calculation. For example, how much time does it take for 100 grams of sodium-24 to decrease to 25 grams? So remember, when you see this, this is how we can write different nuclides, the type of element and the number of nucleons. Sodium-24 
is a radioactive substance. It is a radioisotope. In order to solve this question, we need to know what the half-life of sodium-24 is. Let's take a look at the table again. So you can see here, sodium-24 has a half-life of 15 hours. So I'm going to write that down here. Half-life of sodium-24, 15 hours. Now don't worry, you don't have to memorize the half-life values. The half-life values will be given to you in the exam question. Now, to solve this, there are two ways. You can use the arrow method or you can use a calculation method. I'll show you both. So the first method, which is the arrow method, basically each arrow represents one half-life. So when you use the arrow method, you need to write down the values that are changing. So in this case, the first number must be the value you start with. So if we're starting with 100 grams, we're going to write here 100 grams. Now every arrow represents one half-life. So I'm going to draw an arrow here. If you have the half-life value, you can write the half-life time on the arrow to remind yourself how to do the calculation. So for example, you can write here 15 hours. So this tells you that, okay, every arrow represents 15 hours. After the arrow, you need to write down the value that's half of the number before it. So half of 100 grams is 50. Okay. Now you need to keep going until you get the value that you want, which is 25 grams. Now 50 is not yet 25, right? So let's draw another arrow. Okay, this is another 15 hours. Half of 50 would be 25. And once the numbers are the same, you can stop. And you can see from this calculation here, there are two half-lives with a total of 30 hours. So the total time is 15 hours times 2, which gives us 30 hours. The second method would be to do calculations. And you know that it's always going to be half, 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 half. So if you have learned geometric progression in math, you can use that formula. So in this case, I'll give you a simplified formula developed from the geometric progression. You can use Tn equals to T naught over 2 power of n because it's going half, 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 half. So n represents how many half-lives it has undergone. Tn refers to the term number, the final term number you want, T0 refers to the very first number you start with, the original value you start with. So in this case, Tn is 25 because that's the number we want to end up with. So I'm going to write it on the side here so that you can see we've got 25. And then the original number is 100. And then we've got 2 power of n. Now exchange positions, 2 power of n equals to 100 divided by 25. This gives us value of 4. So if 2 to the power of n equals 4, this means that n equals 2. So what this means is that this sodium-24 has undergone two half-lives, two cycles. So the total time would be 15 hours times 2, giving us a total of 30 hours. Now, whether you use the arrow method or the formula method is completely up to you. My recommendation for most students is to use the arrow method because you'll be able to answer well, most of the questions using the arrow method, especially in SPM and IGCSE. In case you're wondering, oh, but what if they give us a number that you know doesn't fit exactly in the half? Don't worry. In SPM and IGCSE, they will give you numbers that fit perfectly. So it's always going to be half, 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 half. So if you choose to pursue a career in radioactivity, you will, of course, come across real life values that don't fit so perfectly. In that case, you need to use the formula, but that would be after you've done your examinations. So for now, don't worry, everything will fit perfectly. And 
you'll be able to use the error method to answer all questions in SPM and IGCSE. So this formula can be used, but you just need to make sure that you understand half-life to be able to use the formula correctly. Now let's take a quick look at the concept of carbon dating. Now carbon dating is not when carbon and carbon go dating, no. <laughs> carbon dating is a method that is used to find out the age of fossils of carbon-based archaeological discoveries. How does this work? So. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. What you should know is that a small percentage of all carbon atoms are radioactive. They exist as carbon-14. So the food we eat with the carbohydrates and the proteins and all that. So some of the carbon atoms that exist are carbon-14 atoms. The air we breathe, there's carbon dioxide. Some of the carbon dioxide has carbon-14 in them. Now, as long as we're still alive, human beings, animals, plants, we will continue to replenish the carbon-14 that exists inside our bodies because we're eating and breathing. But once the living thing dies, like let's say a tree, okay, so if the tree is living, it's going to continue to replenish its carbon-14 um, atoms that exist inside. But once it dies, It's no longer replenishing the carbon-14, so the carbon-14 would then start to decay and start to decrease. So how carbon dating works is by comparing the life number to the fossil that was discovered. So let me give you a simple question. So here's an example of a question. Let's say the fossil of a tree discovered has a count rate of 100 counts per second. So let's say this dead tree 100 counts. I'm going to write CPS for short here. 100 counts per second. Now we need to find the living equivalent in order to find out what is the count rate while it's still alive. So let's say the living equivalent here is 100 counts per second. Now you might wonder, what if we find a fossil which does not have a living equivalent? So in that case, normally they find the closest living equivalent. For example, a similar species and they compare the count rates to kind of extrapolate the number and then get the rough value of what they think the living equivalence activity would be like. So to do carbon dating, in this case, we want to find out how old this fossil is. We can use the same method of calculation as we did in the previous slide. So for now, we start with the living equivalence count rate. The living equivalent here is 800, so I'm going to write here 800 counts per second. I'm going to use the arrow method in this case. Every arrow represents one half-life, so the number that comes after the arrow should be half the previous number, so that's 400. Next, it goes to 200. And then 100. And you stop when you reach the count rate of the fossil. So you can see here, there are three arrows. Each arrow is 5,730 years. That means the age of the fossil is approximately 5,730 times 3, which gives us 17,190 years. And this is how they approximate the age of fossils that are discovered. You also need to know about the radioactive decay curve. That means the graph that shows us radioactive decay. Now typically, the decay curve would be plotted based on the decreasing mass or the decreasing activity. So I'm going to write on the y-axis here. This could be the mass of the original radioisotopes, or it could be the count rate or activity. I'm going to write here activity. Whether it's mass or activity, the way these values decrease will look the same in the graph. This is always plotted against time. Now, to show you how this curve was developed, 
Whether it's activity or mass, we always start with a particular number. So the number here is not important. I'm just going to write here n. Let's say n represents the original number. Now, after one half-life, now the half-life symbol is usually written this way. It's t half. Okay, I'm just going to move my face here so you can see. That symbol of t half represents half-life. So after one half-life, the number n drops to half. So it will be about here, it drops to half of n. This would be approximately where it would be on the graph. Now, after the second half-life, so same amount of time, but it's another half-life, so t half, n over 2 will have dropped to half. So that would be n over 4. After another half-life, it would now drop to half, which would be n over 8. So again, another half-life. This would now be n over 16. So you can see how this graph has curved. Right? So I'm going to plot, so I'm going to join those lines together now. I'm going to use another color for clarity. And you can see that this gives us a curve graph. So this is commonly known as the radioactive decay curve. So it's not a linear graph. It is a curved graph. And you can see from how the values are plotted, this is why we get a curved graph and not a linear graph. Now, if you're ever asked to plot a graph, please be careful. Think about this. Do you think this graph will ever touch the x-axis? So use your math skills. No, right? Because it's always going to be half. Half, 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 half. It will come very close to the x-axis, but never touch it. It can never reach zero. Very, very near zero. Maybe 0 0.01, 0 0.005, 0 0.000, 000, 000, 000. But it will never touch the x-axis because it will never reach zero. So in general, if you have a radioactive decay curve graph, so I'm just going to draw a quick one here, just a quick reference here. So I'm just going to do a quick sketch here. If you had to determine the half-life from a radioactive curve, let's say, for example, a mass against time graph, it's very easy. Look at the original value. Let's say the original value is 500 grams. You look up 250. The time for it to reach 250, that's the half-life. So depending on the question, sometimes the question could manipulate the values a little bit. Um, but remember, it's always how much time it takes for one to get to half of that value. That's the half-life. Now, sometimes you may get a curve graph that is still curved but slightly different. You may have to take note of the background radiation. So on this slide, we cover, in general, the radioactive decay curves, but these could potentially be values that have already been corrected. The count rates are already corrected. Now, sometimes you may come across activity curve graphs that are slightly different. So I'll go through two different types. One activity graph could be a graph which drops really close to the x-axis, and there's some which might not. Now, you do have to read the question carefully. The graph on the left could be one that has a corrected count rate. So what is corrected count rate? Now, if you don't know what's corrected count rate, please watch my video on detection of radioactivity. But generally, corrected count rate here means that we have already deducted background radiation. So if the count rate is already corrected, then you don't have to minus anything. You just take the original value here. Let's say, for example, if this was 5,000 counts per second, you just take 2,500 
you just take half of that value, for example, 2,500, and you can get the half-life straight away. But sometimes you can come across curved graphs which include background radiation. Now, if you haven't learned background radiation or you can't remember what it is, please watch my video on background radiation. So when we want to take the value of the half-life, we only want to take the activity or count rate of the radioactive material only. Whether the material is decaying or not, the background radiation still exists in the back. The background radiation does not decay. The background radiation remains the same throughout the entire decay process. So if you want to determine the half-life, you need to correct the count rate by deducting the background radiation. So if you get a graph like on the right and the question says that background radiation is included, then you need to minus the background radiation. How do we get the background radiation? Typically, the value at which it starts to level at, this value is the background radiation. Let's say, for example, the background radiation here is 100 counts per second. So if we want to determine the half-life, we need to take into account the background radiation. Let's say the value here will start with 5,000 as well. Now to get the half-life, you need to take only this part. So 5,000 minus 100, I'll write it here, the original activity is 4,900 counts per second. Now half of 4,900, is 2,450. But do not look up 2,450 on the graph because after decay, there is still background radiation. So the number we need to look up here must be 2,450 plus the background radiation, 100, which means you need to look up 2,550 counts per second. The value here, that would be the half-life. I'm going to use a different color so that you can see. So this would be the half-life. So you get this number because it's 4950 divided by 2 plus the background of 100. So that's how you look up the half-life with a graph that includes background radiation. And that's it for this video. So if you found this video educational and helpful, please click like and remember to subscribe for more lessons, solutions, and exam strategies from your physics teacher, Ms. Ho. Happy studying!